And we begin looking for the herring in February. Uh, usually around the middle of February, you'll get a few. Uh, some of us call them scouts. They're either ahead of the rest of the group. They're up there swimming up ahead. And then, uh, you know, they'll be quiet for a while. Then they, then they start coming up after that. In my own personal theory on the herring and their migration is the ones that come up the earliest go the farthest. All right, the ones that enter the pond early go all the way up to Long Pond, across to Parkshire into Great Quiticus. Between uh, Dave Lameau and, and uh, Tom Barron, uh, we've, we've, over the years we've had a competition to see who would find the first ones. We all come down through this run here at Oliver Mill to see if we can find something coming across the top of the ladder. And in February, as usual, the, the fish were seen. But there were a few more than normal. Uh, takes uh, several days before the the fish that come through here are seen up at the, the the ladder. The first time, so I get the emails. We're all on an email chain, and they'll send it out. No, no sightings today, and that goes on for a couple weeks. When you know historically we may have seen one or two. Um, so then once we finally got an email saying, you know, there's, you know, I saw a couple. I saw one or something like that today. Then you're like, okay. It's happening, so that's when I was really excited to like kind of put my vest on and be official and you know go down there and, and see what it's all about. There's been over a 20-year count here at the Namaskat River, and for most of those 20 years, this was the largest run in the state. So it's a really important run. It has the largest amount of spawning or nursery habitat of any run in the state. The Assawamsett Pond Complex is about 5,000 acres for spawning and nursery habitat. So really important area for production of river herring and most years it's been top. In recent years, a couple of the runs have been actually higher than the Masket River. But this year, I expect that it might have regained the title or be very close. So really important run statewide. It started early. It started February 25th is when we saw the first herring down here at Oliver Mill. Our normal strong herring season is the month of April. Whereas this year, it was really strong March, and then we had a really strong push towards the end of April. This seems to be a little bit of an anomaly. It, 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 it's encouraging to see it that long. When you go back into the historical records, the protections afforded the herring started in February and went to June. But traditionally, in these times, the, the counts tend to be March and April and, and really tail off quick in May. We have two separate runs actually. There are two species of, of adult herring. We have the alewife and the blueback herring, both of which make up, make up the general species of river herring. The alewifes generally run first and along about the middle to the end of April, the bluebacks will start mixing in with the alewives. Wareham Street is a uh, weir and pool fishway and it has concrete weirs that are designed to give fish an easy step from site to site. That was built by our agency working with the Herring Commission um, less than 40 years ago. This one was built by the DMF fishway crew about 40 years ago. The pools here are about 30 feet in length and the elevation rises are about a foot per weir. These are concrete weirs even though they look really natural and the walls look beautiful, but you might think they're granite walls, but these are actually concrete footings that we put in as a crew. I can't believe we did this because our crew now is two guys and we just, we wouldn't have the capacity to build this, but they built this for a song 40 years ago, but it, we call this now a nature-like weir and pool fishway. One major part of it that I didn't really understand was part of the whole warden role was the river maintenance. So, you know, the, the latter area is the main area that we go to to count and where people can observe, but the journey for this fish is the entire river. So our chunk in the Middleborough Lakeville area is vital to make sure that, you know, everything's passable and these fish have, you know, access to get to where they need to go. Diatomous fish are sea-run fish, which means they switch habitats to fulfill their life history. 
And most of these fish are born in freshwater habitats like right here and they head out to sea to mature and to grow. And when they're ready to spawn, they come back to the rivers, typically where they were born, and they spawn to complete their life cycle. So they're very unique. Only about 1% of the fish on the planet are diadromous. And in Massachusetts, we have about 15 species. The most common one is river herring, which we have right here in the Damascus River. And again, they, uh, they have this very unique life cycle where they come back to where they were born to spawn to complete their life history. It is very cool that these little fish are coming out of the ocean. It ties us as a community to the ocean. We're not far away to drive, but we here in Lakeville, in Middleborough, and the surrounding towns, we are tied to the coast, tied to our past of coming up the oceans, exploring, tied to the Native Americans, the culture that was always along the rivers as being their main method of getting around. The herring draws people to the river, makes them aware that it's here, and makes them aware that it is an ecosystem that they can enjoy and they can spend time in leisure uh, doing fishing or any other type activity, just canoeing, kayaking. It's, it's just a fantastic resource. A lot of people think that the herring are like the western salmon, that they'll spawn once and die. That is not the case at all. Herring will run year after year. An elderly herring could be eight years old, although most of the herring get eaten before they reach that age. Maybe end of March, but probably April, you start seeing those first ones that went up there coming back, call them fallbacks. And they'll just go, instead of taking the ladder, they'll go right over the waterfall, easiest way back out to the ocean. Seeing them come back can be very, very interesting. They, there are times when they come back in a mass rather than individual or groups. They have their heads faced upstream. They're still gill critters. They, they need to have that flow, but they back down the river. And sometimes there'll be large masses come across. The, but we called them rafts at one time because they, they just, they do, they just come over in a huge mass. But uh, witnessing the fallbacks is uh, something that we all like to see. You don't see it very often. Other, other years, they've started running. We've seen them in February, and then for 30 days, they've stopped. They've just sat down, but, but this year, they continued. Once we've seen them, they've run constantly from February. And March. There's been a few periods where we've had cold weather, some snow, whatever, that they've shut down, but basically, it's been a long run this year. In 2020, the uh, fish started in, in in February, like we normally will, will see some, but the actual uh, heavier countable numbers was a lot earlier. And the other thing that was different this year was the length of the countable numbers. In other words, in previous years, they tend to ramp up and then they die off. Um, they kind of ramped up here and, and we were able to count them for from March into April. So it would look like the 2020 season has been uh, very, very good in, in, in terms of numbers. We count for 10 minutes at a time at Wareham Street. We use a clicker. Uh, and this year, is we've had more counts in the thousands for a 10-minute count than I can recall, again, in the last 15 years since I've been on it. And we had a lot of other high counts. We have what we call a stampede, when so many go over the boards counting at Wareham Street that we can't count them. And it always happens in the middle of your run or towards the end when you're doing a 10-minute count. You have eight minutes into the count, a minute and a half to go, two minutes to go, and you get what we call a stampede. Hundreds pass in seconds, minutes, and this year I had the longest stampede since I've been on the commission, and it lasted for over two minutes, and thousands and thousands of fish passed through. 
So as an observer, you get trained by one of the warden or another observer to make sure that the whole process is done accurately um, and consistently, which is really important to make sure the numbers are right at the end and that it's something that we can use going forward and, and make sure that everything's consistent um, looking back at it. Because these numbers are numbers that are collected for years and years since the 90s. So it's really an amazing um, set of data that we have here. We have a counting box at the head of the, the fish ladder. And inside there we have a, a air temperature gauge, a water temperature gauge, a sheet, and a counter. We put the water temperature gauge in, the air temperature gauge out. You have a little clicker for counting. And you go over to the lead board, which is cleaned to a, uh, a yellow finishing so you can see the fish going over it. Set the timer for 10 minutes and you do a 10 minute count. Uh, we won't get the results until all of the information that we have gets turned into the state, the Marine Fisheries Division. Uh, they'll run it through their computer with their programs and they will ultimately uh, give us the numbers for the year uh, based on, on uh, their system of accounting for the, uh, let's call it the gaps in the counting. So the more counts, the more accurate it is. They have to run a program to account for that. So I grew up in Lakeville and in the 70s, um, as a young kid, my introduction to fishing was through the herring. And it was so easy as a kid to come to this park here, Oliver Mill Park, drop a net into the water and you come up with fish. And what better way to, to learn about fishing, about the, the river and so forth, And because back in those days you could take them. Since 2006, we had a lot of concerns for these runs, so we closed the harvest statewide. Since 2006, we've seen some modest improvements in most runs. This river here, the Namaska, has shown nice improvements in the last 10 years. Last year was a great year for all these larger runs, showed some of the best counts in over 10, 15 years. So the general trend is moving upward for river herring. I, it is important to say that for some of these smaller runs, we're not seeing great improvements. So the status is about um, the same for these smaller runs or holding pace with nice improvements for the larger runs in the last 10 to 15 years. The herring are incredibly important due to the fact that it, they're, they're classified as a marine food fish. Without these herring in the ocean, um, you'd have a decline in, in all of the commercial fish, uh, lobster, whatever. Um, <laughs> They are eaten by everything, and also when they get into the rivers, they're eaten by everything along the river. You, you get to see the eagles come down and hit them, the great blue heron eat them, the gulls of course follow them up the river, and you'll see them all over the place during heron season. The list of, of what they actually feed is endless, and they, they are very important to the overall um, environment. They're kind of like the canary of the, of the uh, aquatic world. So we have approximately 80 different herring runs in the state of Massachusetts. Essentially any river that flows to the ocean in Massachusetts will have some sort of herring run involved with it. Uh, how viable the runs are depends on whether the rivers have been dammed traditionally over the years and whether there is access from the river into a good spawning area for the herring. The larger runs have better spawning areas at their headwaters. They're extremely tough. If you think about our particular herring, they come from uh, Narragansett Bay down in Rhode Island and they go 23 miles from the headwaters of the Braga Bridge down there up to the dam at Assawamsett. Once they hit Assawamsett, some of them go two miles to the right, then they go up the Snake River and all the way up to the end of Long, of Long Pond, and then some go two miles to the left, and then into Parkshire, and then into Great Quiticus. So they spawn throughout the whole Four Pond complex there. Great Quiticus, Parkshire, Assawamsett, and Long Pond. Some of them actually travel 28 miles. That's by how, how the crow flies, but it could be much longer than that. And if you can think about, they have to go through all the rapids and the ocean to get here. 
they're just a, a, a very strong muscular fish that unfortunately for them their whole uh, reason for existence is to be eaten. They are the basis of the food chain. When river herring juveniles exit back to the ocean, there are millions of them and they head in a mass to go out and so many different types of wildlife will seek them out and prey on them. The same for American eel juveniles. So very important for forage. They also are involved with the transport of nutrients. When they come in from the ocean and some do die, the ones that all die, they, they transport those nutrients to freshwater habitats, which is very valuable. It's miles and it's, um, it's dangerous because there's so many potential predators that are out there, um, just the condition of the river, um, anything that could potentially block the river, it hasn't been cleaned out by you know, some of the wardens or anybody else. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's a treacherous journey that these little fish are taking that um, people, you know, come and watch, but don't, like I said, don't fully appreciate, you know, the, the journey that they're taking. I, I believe they say one in every 100,000 makes it back to spawn. Well, this year in 2020 with the COVID-19 situation, it cut down a lot of the visitors that we would normally see at both Oliver Mill Park here and at the Wareham Street Fish Ladder. Uh, it also altered the operation of the wardens that there, we had less um, volunteers this year who were doing the counts. Uh, some people are older and they had uh, some compromised health systems so they didn't feel comfortable coming out in the public at all. But uh, the wardens were still out and around uh, with, <laughs> with masks on and social distancing, keeping an eye on things as best we could. And everyone was you know, being very cautious. We had uh, sanitizer inside the counting box. Uh, we required everyone to wear masks and gloves, which everyone voluntarily did. And generally when you were down there, uh, you were by yourself counting or with a friend. And then also, it did affect the fact that we uh, like to confer with people about, you know, people are down there and they've, they've asked a lot of questions. And uh, you like to you know, educate them, tell them what it is, you know, bring the kids down to a spot where they can actually put their hands in the water and touch the herring. Which, you know, if, if you can touch the herring, it makes it that much more mem memorable for the kids, you know? You know, we're most busy in the spring and, and this pandemic really came on in March. And so we were told that we really couldn't spend much time at our laboratory. We had to work solo. And so we really just bared down. We were assigned the status of a core, um, core employees for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, not essential, but core. So we continued our work mainly maintaining fish ladders, troubleshooting fish ladders to make sure these fish could get back up from the ocean to where they needed to go to spawn. And then we maintain core stations for river herring monitoring, American shad, rainbow smelt, and American eel monitoring. And that was it. A lot of small things that we do, interacting with public um, restoration projects, we had to curtail some of that activity. So we, we stuck with our core responsibilities and I think we did okay this year. Of course, COVID-19 this year meant the Herring Festival was canceled. Um, I will say, 
I came, the few outings we did during the peak in, in March and early April was here to Oliver Mill just to be outside a little bit and it was very well used. So while I think it took away from the festival aspect of large crowds at the river, I think it has been more important for that getaway for people to be socially distanced, to be outside. And I was a uh, chief of planning and engineering for the state park system for a couple of years. And it really brings in the importance of our outside parks, of our natural resources, and how important those are to our well-being, to our health, because during this COVID crisis, it has given people somewhere to go, to get outside, to, to enjoy themselves, because it has been a difficult time for so many. As the town hall was closed, we were challenged for meeting space, so we actually didn't hold any meetings from March right up until June. Our, our first meeting since February this year was actually outside at the Wareham Street fish ladder where we sat in a in a big circle uh, with our masks on and that was actually the first in-person meeting we'd had since March. So being a first year warden during the 2020 season um, was interesting it wasn't I felt a little um, a little gypped I guess um, I didn't get to learn I don't think as much as I could have just because of the social distancing and um, in my personal life I was working a lot more than I normally would have been so I didn't get the same opportunity to go down to count the fish or to interact with the community uh, so I, I'm looking forward to 2021 <laughs> but, um, but it was an interesting experience I still did um, go down and, and see the fish and you know enjoy it but, um, but I don't think I really got that connection that I was hoping for when I signed up in September. When I do think of the herring run, I think of, it is become, because of industry, for instance, the old Oliver Mills, where dams were created, the river was used for power, the river was used for industry, that through the years, over the last 50 years or so, we've brought that back and really worked together here at the herring run in, in, on Wareham Street to use man's influence to help nature get back to where it was. And those are continual things that we work on, you know, at the state level with the Department of Ecological Restoration and looking to see where can we remove dams, where can we improve things and kind of take back and put back things the way they were the best we can and enhance it. Even though it is man-made, we might be able to enhance the situation for the herring and overall for Massachusetts and for the entire Eastern Seaboard, so much of our offshore ecology depends on those herring and they depend on the Namaskat River, the Aswamsa Pond complex to keep thriving. If I could highlight the uh, Three Mile River for a minute, there's a new fish ladder that was built last fall and the Three Mile River is a really important tributary to the Taunton River, the same as the Namaskat River. These are important tributaries that each can have their own herring run and so the Draca Dam at the Three Mile River has had no fish passage for well over a hundred years, maybe a couple hundred years. And the interest to put a fish ladder there goes way back. People got involved 20 years ago. I got involved in 2009. It was given to me as a training project to help me learn how to execute these projects. It took a long time. There were three different properties where we had to get permissions to build the fishway, to access the fishway, and it took a long time to get those agreements. And we got involved with Save the Bay, a local partnership there, the towns of Dighton and Taunton, and everybody worked really hard to come together with the property owners to make it happen. And it, it took a long time, but it, it happened last year. I led the project as the project manager. The Division of Marine Fisheries got the money through several grant sources, and it was constructed by Sumco Eco Engineering in 2019. So this was the first spring where the fish could actually get back upstream in that system in well over 100 years. So we've been going there weekly to monitor it. We're taking measurements to make sure the fishway is performing as it was designed. And we stocked herring there about a month ago. And working with the Herring Commission, the fish were grabbed here, actually downstream at uh, Wareham Street, but the same herring run. We grabbed 1,000 herring from the Namaskat River and stocked them in the system. So hopefully those babies that are born there will queue to that system and come back to where they were born. 
We'll stock again for two more years to hopefully jumpstart the herring fishery there, or the herring run, and hopefully the fish will come back on their own. So it's a good example of a collaborative project that took many years to build. We built it for about $90,000, so it wasn't terribly expensive, and it's a state-of-the-art fishway that hopefully will bring fish back to the Three Mile River. I feel like a lot of people, you know, it's a fish, and that's kind of the mindset of it. Um, but it's when you start learning about their history and their natu like native instincts, just like it's really amazing their whole process. Uh, every single year, as a commission, we vote on giving, donating, or lending 2,000 herring to the Dep Department of Rhode Island Fisheries. In in the last few years, it's been the Massachusetts uh, State Fishery. They've been doing a stocking project, and when we say loan them our herring because they're born here, whatever, we can loan them to them for this year. They'll, they put them in the Three Mile River, and after they go up and lay their eggs, next year, if they make it, they will come back to the Damascus River because this is their home base. They're ingrained here. That's why we loan them. We don't give them to them. The adults will come back, and in three years, those fry that have been spawned in that particular pond will go to that particular pond. So even though we're moving them, they are literally being borrowed because they're coming back the next year. So it's really incredible that they know where they were spawned to go to that same exact spot every single year. And then in turn, where they spawned, those offspring will now come back to that new river and therefore repopulate it. So that's one of the things I learned that is just like, for me, mind blowing because I love anything related to animals or you know ecology and all of that. And that just is like fully encompassing and it's a whole, ecosystem in and of itself and it's just amazing so this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic only one taking was taken by Massachusetts Rhode Island didn't come up at all What happened the day we stocked fish? Well, it, was, it almost didn't happen because of COVID-19. We canceled all our other stocking events this year because we were concerned about the proximity of people to make it happen. We wanted to have one stocking event to really highlight this new fishway at the Drake Dam in the Three Mile River. So we really wanted to make it happen. We came down to Wareham Street in the Namaskat River. We coordinated with the Herring Commission here. They had staff there to help us. We had two technicians and two biologists working with our crew. We have a stocking truck that's made just for stocking river herring. It's got a pump system, it's got oxygen pumped into it. It's really designed just for that purpose, so we're very happy to use it. We didn't want, we can take 2,500 fish in that tank. We wanted a small number so they were in good shape, so we took 1,000. They come down with a tank truck with uh, volunteers with nets and maybe about five or six people with nets. They get up the nets, scoop them into the tank and they get truck them to wherever they're going to go as quickly as they possibly can. This year they went to the Three Mile River in North Dighton, which was only a one half hour ride, which was very good. And they introduced them upriver from the new ladder that they installed and they successfully dropped the fish off there and uh, the biologists there were very happy that the, how the fish looked coming out of the tank truck. So thought it was very successful. We, we get a count, a pretty accurate count, and then we truck them out, we start up the air raid to start out the oxygen system, and we brought them over to Drake Dam. We had guys there from the, 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 the Dighton Conservation Commission, the Taunton Conservation Commission, and those folks were really excited about this process. They've been waiting a long time for this to happen. So, and then we brought the fish over, we released them. We didn't have a single dead fish in the tank. And usually you have a couple percentages of dead fish. They were all in great shape because it was close proximity and we released the fish into the system.
It's a little bit of a shock for them when they come in because it's a new place, but they acclimate, they get used to it. When they're ready to spawn, they release the, their eggs and their, their sperm, and the young are born there, and hopefully they, they accue to that system. And three to four years down the road, they come back to spawn in that same system. What happens when these fish are in the spawning run is that they're, they're, they're mature and they're nearly ripe. And so when they're ripe, they spawn where they are. And they, they just want decent freshwater habitat. So what'll happen is the females are basically, um, they're, they're courted by the males. And so several males will court an individual female and they'll, they'll fertilize the eggs once they're released. They settle to the bottom and they're a little bit sticky and the fertilized egg will stick for a day or two, then they'll be released, and they'll, then they'll hatch in like three to four days. And those little babies, they'll cue to where they are, the chemistry of that, that system. The adult herring, when they, when they spawn, they'll, they'll lay the eggs up in, uh, in the pond complex, and the eggs will hatch within actually a few weeks, and the fry will live in the ponds for a few months, and you'll actually see them circling around the, the banks of the ponds. It seems like they want to stay in the shallower waters to keep away from the, the fish that are looking for lunch. Beyond the river, the Aswamps of Pond Complex, which is what is feeding the river. The river exists because it's the outlet for the pond complex. And when you think about the pond complex, it does bring together all of southeastern mass, not only the host towns, Lakeville, Middleborough, Rochester, Freetown that abut and own uh, landmass in and around the pond complex. But it's the water source for Taunton. It's the water source for New Bedford and those metropolitan areas. So the pond complex itself, which includes the river as part of that, really does bring the southeastern mass delegation together because my colleagues in New Bedford depend on it just as much as we do. There's often questions, who manages these river herring? It, it's really a little complicated. It's a state resource, it's a state river, and so the Division of Marine Fisheries has ultimate responsibility to manage them, but at a local level, if there's going to be a harvest, it's the local folks that manage it. And so for here, you've got a two-town commission, the Middleborough Lakeville Herring Fishery Commission, and they've been at it for decades, and they do a fantastic job. To me, it's really the model of how to have local stewardship to manage a herring run. These, these guys, they operate as herring wardens and they have jurisdiction to tell people they can't, what they can and cannot do. And they do an amazing job keeping the runs open. If there's a harvest, they manage the harvest. I wish every town could have a commission like this. And there's, a, there's probably another 10 or so like it in Massachusetts, but there's a not enough. Well, the Herring Fishery Commission in its current form started in the late 1990s, the mid 1990s, when a, a interested group of citizens got together and came up with the format of the commission the way it's established now and um, special legislation actually was passed that allowed the selectmen to appoint members of the herring commission and the current formation we have seven fish wardens which are the voting members of the commission and we also have other volunteers which we call volunteer observers who assist the wardens they have essentially the same duties except that they are they have no vote on the policy and financing that the commission votes on. The warden has to be from Middleborough or Lakeville. An observer does not. We have observers from all different towns, which is great. Um, and a warden is a voted in position for the town, and they come together once, once a month to have a meeting um, to discuss ongoing issues regarding the heron and surrounding the heron. I kind of expected the commitment, but it really, like the level of commitment from the rest of the wardens and the passion that they have for it is really inspiring. They are so knowledgeable and they are so willing to teach, which is, you can be knowledgeable and not really, you know, have that desire to teach or ha take the time to. And all the guys that I am on the commission with are just really open to teaching me and, um, you know, we're, we're ex more excited to have like fresh person in there willing to learn. So um, I'm like very blessed to be, to be a part of it. 
there's more to it than counting fish. There's a lot more to it than counting fish. There's, there's making sure there's water for them to get in and out. There's making sure that the predation isn't uh, overpowering, and that's human predation. Uh, the natural predation is going to go on before and after us, but it's the human predation that, that needs to be monitored and watched. The human population has increased so much in coastal rivers and coastal watersheds in the last you know, 40, 50 years. We're seeing declines in water quality. We're seeing declines in the quantity of water, uh, water that's available for these fish. So we can't just focus on fish passage. We have to focus on habitat as well. Well, when it comes to the health of the Namaskat River, there are multiple issues going on. It's hard to pick one as the single most issue. Um, it is a flat river um, that we can't do much about. Um, the drop from Aswamset to Wareham Street is only a matter of feet, and that's numbers of miles. So as an engineer, it's always intrigued me. It's a very flat river, and therefore, it's susceptible to silt, slow-moving water, and weeds. So it is very important, I think, that we've got the Herring Commission working to remove the weeds from the river because it has choked in. And you know, as a teenager, when I was out on that section between, let's say, Old Bridge Street and Aswamset, there were weeds in the marshes, but they now have become really wood, wooded weeds. They, you, could, you could still get a canoe through in between meanderings. If you were trying to get a shortcut between the meanders of the river, you could make your way through the weeds, whereas today you just could not do that. I think it's something that people are kind of blind to in a weird way. I mean, you can obviously see the weeds and you see the growth of them, but for people that are not knowledgeable about the way the rivers work and the need to reduce the weeds, um, before I was on the commission, I really didn't have that knowledge. I knew of the river ecosystem and I knew that that existed and there's a lot of um, complex ins and outs of it, but I really wasn't fully aware of the impact the weeds have or um, how it, many invasive plants that we have. Um, which is really a, a problem. So I think that the general public probably sees it, but it's something that they see so regularly that it becomes, you know, they're blind to it. They don't, they don't really see it or see it as a problem. One of the misconceptions that people have about the herring is they come down in the springtime of the year and they look and they say, wow, this is great, they have high water. Well, what they don't understand in a normal year the water goes down in the lakes, they dam up the lakes, and the herring are trapped there, the baby fry are trapped there. Traditionally, they come back late in the fall. We get the hurricane rains. We don't get necessarily get the hurricanes, but we get the hurricane rains that raise the pond level, and then the herring start coming back down. When the water gets low, the water, because it's pumped for both Taunton water supply, Assawamsit, and New Bedford water supply out of Great Quiticus, when they're pumping, the flow actually reverses and it goes from Assawamset into Parkshire into Quiticus. So you have the combination of all the sand and sediment in the river, then you have all the weeds and, and no water going into the river itself. The only water that's supplying that river is just a little bit from the herring run up at the dam and also any water that's left the draining from the marsh and the swamplands. So it's our herring fry that really have a problem getting back. In the last I don't know how many years we've had fish kills. Well, the problem with the weeds, they are continually, continually growing in the Masket River. Sometimes if the water level is low, it chokes out the uh, fry head, heading back to the, uh, to the ocean. It'll deplete the oxygen, it'll trap them, and we will see what they call fish kills. We'll see hundreds, maybe seeing thousands of fry dead in the river. And so, <clears throat> We are trying to, uh, the, the project we are trying with the Eco Harvester is to pull the weeds out as uh, a trial section of the river. And uh, we've had uh, help from a lot of people along the way, including um, the Freitas's, who are allowing us to deposit the weeds on their property. And they can believe they can use that as fertilizer for their farm. So that would be good if that could work out that way. Most people are familiar with the spring migration where they see the adults migrating up the river and the thick run of the, the herring migrating up. 
they don't think so much of the migration of the the baby fry heading back downstream but that's as important as the adults running upstream because we want to be able to allow the fish to get back out to the ocean where they can live for three or four years and then make their own first spawning run. Well with water levels like we have now and there's, there's no boards in the dams up at uh, Assawampsett Pond, uh, free access in and out, they don't have to use the ladder up there, the, uh, they can leave whenever they want. Um, in low water they search and search for any kind of an outlet. The Taunton Water Department and New Bedford Water Department have been incredibly cooperative with us. If we need to have um, a board taken out to allow the fish out, if we see big clouds and there isn't that flowage that you'd like to have, they are very accommodating. They'll run down there and yank a board or two and, and let the fish fish out for us. Uh, so it's a cooperative effort up and down the entire river. In looking around at the needs of the district, um, the Herring Commission has been working over the years on this weed removal. And they were getting some money from the towns, 5,000 each town a year, and trying to add that up. But the engineering was chewing a lot of that money up. And the permitting just kept going on and on. So there aren't many opportunities to get earmark funding uh, at the state level. But through the budget process, I went ahead and put an earmark in that allowed the Herring Commission to get direct funding. It wouldn't rely on anything, that it would just be direct funding. And in addition to that, Senator Rodericks, who covers Lakeville um, as part of the, the complex in Rochester and Freetown, he also worked from the Senate side, and this is where it's great we work together. From the House side, I got the m money in the budget for the Herring Commission weed removal. From the Senate side, he got money in to do more of the studies that we need to then do further projects that may be more complicated, more expensive. So it was great to work as a team where we got some funding that can be used immediately on a project and then funding that will help steer us to the next projects. This project that we've been working on, it, it's frustrating. We worked for years on it. We got all the permitting process. Uh, one of the other wardens, Ron Burgess, has been working on it for years. There's a study out from 1982 that they proposed back then, they talked about weed removal. Back in the 60s, they talked about weed removal and sand removal. This is not a new problem, it's been ongoing. In, in around 1978, um, there was a comprehensive plan initiated by the Conservation Commission that uh, took into consideration the entire Namaskat River, starting at the dam all the way to the Taunton River and there were various projects that were earmarked in that plan. First and foremost was the removal of the sediment from 104 years of neglect um, at the head of the river uh, and install a sand trap to prevent that damage to the, to the environment from continuing. Uh, there were other things. There was the dredging at Wareham Street of all the weeds. There were four or five different uh, canoe launches that were proposed. There was land to be purchased along the river, etc. Um, and in the last couple of years, due to the success that the Herring Commission has had with, with the management of the Herring, uh, one of our duties, obviously, is to do whatever we can to in encourage or improve the Herring run. Um, and the old plan was pulled out and, and brought forward. Uh, along with a lot of conferencing that uh, various officials uh, have taken part in, um, Representative Oral uh, understood the need for, for funding to be able to, to get these projects moving. Over the years, uh, weed growth, both natural wetlands vegetation and invasive species of milfoil, fanwort, are starting to choke the rivers to the point where we're seriously concerned about uh, herring passage issues, uh, eutrophication of the river itself, uh, runoff from the roads that carries phosphorus nutrients, runoff from lawn fertilizers with uh, phosphorus, sewage runoff, uh, things of that sort all contribute to excess nutrients in the river which in turn contributes to excess weed growth over the years. Number one, the channel itself has, has choked off. 
but one of the changes I see is it's the conversion because there were weeds back in the 80s when I was canoeing there were weeds in between the meandering main channel and it's my suspicion that because it is slow moving that with those weeds silt allowed to collect and with silt collecting land starts to form and then during drought seasons that allows conversion of the type of weeds and conversion of the vegetation from an aquatic vegetation to almost more of a land-based vegetation and when you go out there today you'll see a lot of st wood stems those weren't there to the extent they are today The milfoil is, is the, the, the material that we're trying to get out of the river. It seeds um, like a flower and so on. It has its blooming section, but also pieces of it can also um, land and start to grow. Uh, the, the leaves, the stems, what have you. So the methodology that we proposed and gotten a permit is for a machine called an echo harvester. And this machine actually pulls the material out by the roots so that you don't leave anything. It also collects that material so that there will not be any pieces floating down river and what have you. That material is collected and then it would be taken to the shore, taken away from the river and allowed to dry out and, and uh, rot. Uh, over the last two years we've been obtaining permits from the local conservation commission we currently have wetlands permits from the Middleborough and the Lakeville Conservation Commission we have a natural heritage permit from the state to proceed uh, unfortunately we're still waiting for a natural heritage permit from the federal government because the river is home to a turtle known as the red-bellied cooter which is an endangered species so we we certainly want to make sure that uh, we protect those with any work that we do and that doesn't adversely affect them. We plan just doing the ch center channel of the river, nothing on the sides to disturb anything else. Um, we are required to uh, have a turtle expert there because of the red-bellied cooter is an endangered species and uh, a protected species. So we're going to have someone there, ahead of the boat, looking um, to keep the red-bellied cooters out of the way. And also, as the uh, weeds are being de deposited, they will, you know, along with us uh, volunteers also, will go through all that to make sure none of these turtles are taken into the weeds and, you know, stuck there and they can't get back to the water. You know, we'll get them back in the water too. We have a very unique problem that any type of weed removal has always been done on a pond level or a lake. We have a river system. Right now, if you look at it, this is a fast, free-flowing river. But again, in the summertime, when the water stops and there's no river, it's not a free-flowing river. It's basically stop in between the sediment buildup that's been there for 100 years with no sediment removal, and you have the weeds that every year when they lower the water and block it off, the, weed, the milfoil comes up, grows two feet up and four feet across the surface. So then you have these weeds that are constantly clogging the river, you have a low water level which is encourages their growth and now when they die and whatever they're just building up between the muck and the sand and the sediment it, it's it's becoming a problem for our fry to get back the timing of, of being able to actually accomplish this project uh, it's twofold ish in, in there in the issues uh, one of them obviously is the uh, red belly cooter in this uh, there is a certain time in which um, they, they lay their eggs and they hatch and so on that you'd have little ones in the river. And there's also, because we're a herring commission, our concern isn't the red-bellied cooter, but it's the herring. And traditionally, early fall is when the fry um, would be coming back down the river. So 
we need to get the reeds out to get the fish into the herring, into the ponds so they can spawn, but also once the spawn is hatched, we need to be able to get the spawn back out, or the, or the hatchlings back out to sea. Um, so what happened was in, in going through this process, um, the Natural Heritage Program put one constriction on, on the permitting, and that would be that we would be able to do it in the first two weeks of August, because after that, you have both the hatchlings of the red-bellied cooter and you would have the fry coming back out of the ponds at, at its earliest time. So we're constricted in, in two weeks, in the first two weeks of, of uh, August, by our permit. A lot of the stuff that we talk about with the river, sometimes it's just so far over people's heads, unless you're out in a kayak in the river, you really, you know, and I kayak the river and sometimes they're talking and I'm like, I don't know what you guys are talking about, you know, can we go out real quick right now and show me? Because that's really what I need to see it. Um, so I think it's a hard thing to sell, especially when we're asking for money, when it's something that we can't really explain to an everyday person. So I think that's one of our biggest challenges too, is trying to explain the importance of it to somebody who has no idea what we're talking about. I, I think, um, you know, the public, we need the public support because, you know, it's, it's public funds, these are public resources. And I think people are always asking, why are these river herring in tough shape? Well, there's a lot of things going on. And I think that the one thing that probably doesn't have as much attention I just touched on, and that's that landscape alterations from human population growth in the last generation have been remarkable. And so I think it's really important to have the public think about what can they do to try to improve water quality, water quantity, and that's really just conservation, you know, and, and trying to conserve water, trying not to pollute water bodies with fertilizer use, excessive pesticide, herbicide use, all those things I think the average public can get involved and say to their own towns, hey, let's not use as much of these chemicals and let's try to conserve our water and, and try to make sure these rivers have some water for the fish. So. I think that, that grassroots conservation is really important. I find the herring run is very important to the area because it brings together not only being outdoors, it brings together the actual river and what you can enjoy on the river, but it also brings together the hist history and the culture going back to the Native Americans who had a fish weir here at Oliver Mill Park, who had um, used the herring in such an important way. We think of the pilgrims and how it was used as planting. Um, it's always been a resource, and during the 18th century, 19th century, where the towns of Middleborough and Lakeville actually made money from uh, allowing a catch of herring, because a portion of that money would go back to the towns. And it's always been an important part. It's been such a great natural resource, the Namaskat River itself being a beautiful and wonderful natural resource for the area.